All right, here we are again. Chapter 10, Nuclear Physics. Once again, there's a lot of new terminology, some stuff you've probably seen before from like high school science class or something like that, but we're gonna get into more detail, more depth, and yeah, probably talk about some things that you didn't see then. So pretty much nuclear, meaning of the nucleus, something like that, but we're talking about physics within the nucleus of atoms. In the last chapter, I think it was the last chapter, we talked a good bit about molecules and bonds and all that having to do with chemistry, chemical bonds, and that has to do with electromagnetic forces. And molecules are very small, but we're going to now be talking about things within the nucleus of the atom, which is much, much smaller, and hence the energies involved are much, much greater. However, you can kind of get to thinking about nuclear physics by using your thinking about molecules and chemical bonds and binding energy and disassociation because the way that we think about the stuff that makes up the nucleus like protons and neutrons it's generally in a similar fashion it, they bond together except it's no longer electrical forces binding together it's something called the strong force and they have a certain binding energy if you want to break them apart you have to give that enough energy in order to break them apart so there's definitely a similar view between thinking about chemical bonds and thinking about nuclear bonds, or bonds within the nucleus. But yeah, the size we're talking about is much, much smaller, like a hundred thousand times smaller than the size of an atom, meaning that the energies involved are something like a hundred thousand times greater. One key place where we see nuclear physics in action is in stars, like a sun. So the sun itself is powered by a nuclear core, nuclear fusion to be exact, and yeah, that's where most of the energy in the solar system comes from. We'll get more into some of the details of this stuff as we go along, that conversion of protons, and a little bit about the other particles involved. One thing to point out though is that if the sun wasn't nuclear, if it was just like a really, really big bonfire, it would have burned out a long time ago. Alright, so here we go. The nucleus, right? In the upper left there, we have a one sort of picture of an atom where most of the volume of the atom is this electron cloud, this probability cloud. You can draw shapes by designating, you know, the 95% probability region or the 90% probability region. So this looks like a 1s or an s orbital overall, right? It's just like a spherical orbital. So maybe imagine it's just the ground state, the lowest energy state of some atom, and We've said before that the nucleus is just a really small thing on the inside, but now we can get a little bit more detailed about that, where if we kind of zoom into the nucleus, it's made up of these protons and neutrons, which are themselves made up of other things, but we'll get to that next chapter. It's a fairly good approximation, works quite well for nuclear physics at least, just to think about the protons and the neutrons as these balls, spheres. So the nucleus is just a cluster of these spheres all together. Or for hydrogen, it's just the proton that one little ball. So the stuff that makes up the nucleus, we call them nucleons, protons and neutrons. And like I said, the nucleus of an atom is approximately 100,000 times smaller than the atom itself. So that's on the order of a femtometer, 10 to the minus 15 meters. The book has a nice analogy in this one where if you think about the size of the nucleus, it's sort of like thinking about the size of a baseball sitting inside a baseball stadium or a baseball field, right? The baseball itself is like the nucleus. The stadium is like the atom. Gives you an idea of this relative scale, the size of the atom to the size of the nucleus. Very small. We're gonna need some terminology. Again, you might have seen some of this stuff before, but yeah, when we classify nuclei, well, a couple of different ways. For one, the atomic number, which you generally write as Z, or we're gonna write as Z, is, well, it's how many protons are in this nucleus. That is to say, the atomic number essentially defines the element that we're talking about. Z is one, hydrogen, two, helium, three, oh, I always get lost, lithium, beryllium, uh, yeah, not against. Anyway, atomic number, Z. The neutron number, nicely enough, just N, just number of neutrons in the nucleus. And so Z, the atomic number defines the element, but n can be widely different than z. 
and a lot of the lower atomic number elements, a lot of the low proton nuclei, n is similar usually to uh, z. The number of neutrons is pretty similar usually to the number of protons in smaller nuclei. In larger nuclei, it turns out that you end up needing more neutrons in order to kind of stabilize the nucleus. So the neutron number tends to get a good bit bigger than the atomic number. And then finally, we have the atomic mass, which is just the sum of the number of protons, the number of neutrons, z plus n. It's nice enough that it turns out the mass of the proton and the mass of the neutron are very similar. So we talk about the atomic mass, roughly the mass of the nucleus. But we're going to need to be more exact as we go along, so we'll get into the exact difference in a little bit. So like I was saying, the number of neutrons can be different, and nuclei with the same proton number but different neutron numbers are what we call isotopes. So hydrogen usually is just one proton, but you can have hydrogen with a, a proton with a neutron, and that's an isotope of hydrogen. Or a, a proton with two neutrons is another isotope of hydrogen, called pruritum. When we're talking about the nuclei and nucleons, the protons and the neutrons, it's really useful to have a unit that's just like basically one proton mass or one neutron mass, really close to that. We call that the atomic mass unit, just U. And U is defined as one twelfth the mass of carbon-12, which figure out, work out yourself, but it's something like 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And if you're wondering why one U is not just the mass of one proton, well, that's a big part of nuclear physics is that the masses of these nucleons is not necessarily always the same. When we want to refer to nuclei, it's useful to have some shorthand, and we call this a symbolic representation, where X is the element you're talking about, then A is the mass number up there, and Z is the atomic number. Really, Z and X are telling you the same thing, but we've named all these elements, so there you go, put the element name and then the atomic number, and then the mass number. So examples here, carbon is six, six protons, and you can have one isotope of carbon is six neutrons, 12, six carbon. Uh, copper, 29, uh, helium, this is the standard helium, two protons, two neutrons, and strontium, they're just examples. And sometimes when we use this notation, I don't necessarily write all of the stuff all the time, like you'll see maybe carbon-12. Again, partly because the Z and the element are saying the same thing. But there's also extra things that might be added on too, could be like the charge. We're kind of assuming uh, the Z is uh, positive numbers, but we can use this representation to indicate things beyond just nuclei, like nucleons themselves, or like electrons, or even positrons. But if you do that, then you know, use the same sort of notation of proton, we just write as P, and then one for Z, right? One proton, and the atomic mass is one, just one nucleon. N for neutron would be zero, it has no charge, there's no protons there, and atomic mass one, one nucleon. Electron, minus one, it's a minus one charge, and zero for the atomic mass, at least in this representation. The electron's mass is something like 2,000 times less than the proton and the neutron in terms of the atomic mass, that's just zero. But that mass does come into play in when we talk about nuclear physics, and we'll see it. One interesting graph to look at is the graph of stable nuclei. And so stable, basically meaning that these nuclei can exist and they'll just hang around. They're fine to just hang around by themselves. They're not going to fall apart. Um, they're good. The graph is showing Z, the number of protons, or the atomic number, versus N, number of neutrons, and the blue dots, or lines, are indicating which Z, N coordinates are stable. So at the very bottom left there, you have like one, zero, is like the first one on there, that's hydrogen. One proton, zero neutrons, and it's stable, it's fine. And if you move your way up, you know, you get to helium and lithium, beryllium, uh, they're all fairly stable around with the same amount of protons and neutrons. So this red line is showing essentially a slope of one, 
or when the number of neutrons equals the number of protons. And like I said, for a low proton number, or like early elements in the periodic table, they're fairly fine to be stable with equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Those blue lines, dashes, are following the red line, following the slope equal one. Once you get to about, I don't know, 18, 19, 20, the number of neutrons starts to increase faster than the number of protons. Right? The slope is increasing. And as it turns out, once you get to something like 50, 60 along there, the slope sort of stabilizes again, but it's now n equals 2z. Right? So we've gone from a slope of 1 down towards the bottom left to a slope of about 2 towards these higher end, the larger nuclei. That's like I was saying earlier, that the larger nuclei tend to need more neutrons in order to remain stable. I'll say something about why that is later. And also just interesting to note that the blue lines, some of them are vertical. There's vertical segments. That's indicating that there are multiple isotopes that are stable for one element. So like 50 there is one of the highest kind of straight vertical blue dash lines. I mean, there's a good number of isotopes that are stable for the atomic element with 50 protons. 50 protons, it looks like, is neodymium. So it has at least five or six sort of isotopes that are stable. This is just kind of another way of looking at these stable nuclei, but given more information about them, and also saying something about the unstable ones as well, the unstable isotopes. It's called the chart of nuclei. It's like another name for nuclei, uh, isotopes of different nuclei. So the blue band are the stable isotopes. Right? So you can see that uh, there's two stable isotopes for hydrogen. Hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2. So the number in there is just indicating the atomic mass of the isotope. So H1, just one proton, H2, a proton, a neutron. And you can see there's then two stable isotopes of helium, two of lithium, one of beryllium, two of boron, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We only got to chlorine in this chart, but yeah. In and for the stable isotopes, the number in there is indicating the abundance, or the relative abundance, of that isotope. So if you look, just try to find hydrogen that naturally occurs, 99.9% .9 of it is going to be H1. 0.01% of it can be H2. Very lopsided, that one. Well, something like chlorine is a bit different, right? Chlorine-35 is a stable isotope. Chlorine-37 is also a stable isotope. And the relative abundance is about 75% uh, and 25% between the two. So beyond just the stable nuclei, this chart's also showing the unstable ones. Unstable meaning that these nuclei are, are not going to just stick around for ever. Some for a very short period of time, some for a longer period of time, but they tend to decay. And the color is indicating the scale of their half-life, and then the number inside there tells you the actual so half-life we'll talk about in a little bit, but essentially if you have a chunk of this material, kind of say boron, say boron 12, if you have a chunk of that material, then it's going to take 22.2 milliseconds for half of that boron 12 to have decayed. And just a couple of interesting ones, I think I tried to find the most extreme examples on here. It looks like chlorine 36 is unstable but its half-life is given as about 300,000 years, a long half-life. That, as opposed to the shortest one here, which actually says it's an uncertain measurement, but boron-16 shows its half-life as less than 190 picoseconds. So 190 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So very, very fast. Wide range of half-lives. This chart just shows some of the elements that are stable and the different isotopes and their atomic mass in atomic mass units. So if you look at carbon-12, its atomic mass is exactly 12 atomic units, because that's how we define an atomic unit, is one twelfth of a carbon-12 atom, or carbon-12 nuclei. But if you look at like hydrogen, hydrogen-1, just one proton, its atomic mass is not one. It's actually a little bit greater than one. And if you look at these other nuclei, they have masses that are not necessarily equal to their atomic mass number. So the atomic mass number is just the number of protons and neutrons. But again, a proton and a neutron are slightly different weight for one, but also 
if you have protons and neutrons sort of by themselves, their mass is different than when you put them together. The other thing to note here is that since there are multiple stable isotopes for different elements, if you want to talk about the mass of that element, and you do a weighted average of the different stable isotopes by their abundance, basically just means you multiply the abundance by the mass of each isotope and add them together. What's going on in the nucleus then? There kind of has to be something else besides electromagnetism going on. It's just electromagnetism. The neutrons are electrically neutral, so they're not going to impact anything in there. And the protons are all positively charged, so they're all going to repel each other. So if it was just this electromagnetic force, then the protons would all want to push themselves apart and no nuclei would be stable. We call this new force that holds the nucleons together the strong force, or the strong nuclear force. And basically it just acts between any nucleons. It's going to want to bind nucleons together. So neutrons to neutrons, protons to protons, protons to neutrons, right? The strong force is between all of them. The thing is though that the strong force only acts over a very short distance. If you were to look at like a potential diagram for the strong force, it looks kind of like the binding diagrams you saw before, the dip down and come back up, but the scale where it basically becomes zero potential again, where there's no force between these things, is really, really short scale. It's like uh, the size of a proton, it's like a femtometer. Pretty much after you get more than like a proton's length away, then the neutrons and the protons are not gonna be really attracting each other via the strong force anymore. Yeah, so this picture is showing all these nucleons being attracted to a neutron, so it's showing those arrows going one way, but you know, like any force that you really imagine, that force is going in like the neutron to the proton and also the proton to the neutron. They're pulling each other together. And this range of the nuclear force, this very short range of the nuclear force, can give you an idea of why larger nuclei end up needing more neutrons. The strong force is really only between like sort of neighboring nucleons in the nuclei. And when you get bigger and bigger and bigger, there's no sort of like increase in the overall like pulling together of all the nucleons, right? Because they're only pulling against really kind of each other, or the ones right next to each other, maybe a little bit the ones right next to that. Right? But if you get a big nucleus with like 30, 40, 50, 60 protons and neutrons, there's a lot beyond just those nearest neighbor ones. However, the electromagnetic force has a much larger range, and so more and more protons in there they all start to feel more and more of that electromagnetic force that's trying to push them apart. The result of that being that you kind of need to add more neutrons in order to sort of mediate between the electromagnetic forces. Right? So you put more and more neutrons in there, they're not participating in the electromagnetic force, but they add to the overall strong force that binds the nucleus together. You know, you get up to like 60 protons in a nucleus, you end up needing like 120 neutrons in order to keep a that nucleus together in order to make a stable nucleus. So you can pretty well approximate the size of a nucleus just by saying that its volume grows with the atomic mass number. Okay. So you could write that as the volume of the nucleus is, well, we're going to call it essentially a sphere, and that is equal to some constant times the atomic mass number. And if you take that assumption that the nucleus is essentially a sphere, then the volume of the sphere is equal to Ka, and if you solve that equation for R, the radius of the nuclei as a function of A, the atomic mass number, or just mass number, then you get something like this, where the radius goes as the cube root of the mass number. And R0 is just made up of this other stuff, like it's like the square root of 3k over 4 pi, we just write as R0, and it turns out it's about 1.2 femtometers. This is actually a fairly good approximation for the volume of nuclei. So if that's true, what is the radius of iron 56? And also what is the approximate density? We can assume the mass of iron 56 is approximately 56 U, 56 atomic mass units. Okay, what do we got? So to find the radius, we're just going to use that formula that goes as the cube root of the atomic mass number. And we're told iron 
Trying out iron 56, meaning that the radius of this isotope of iron is going to be about 4.6 femtometers. Pretty straightforward. This was A. Okay, what about its density then? Right, well, density is mass per volume. So we're assuming the volume is a sphere. We have the radius now so we can get the volume. That volume is going to be in cubic meters and the density maybe we want it in kilograms per cubic meter. So we just need to convert 56 atomic mass units to kilograms. And go back to the earlier slide I told you what this conversion factor is. It's kilograms per atomic mass unit. That comes out to be uh, 9.296 times 10 minus 26 kilograms. Right. So then the density is going to be that mass divided by the volume, 4 thirds pi, and our radius, and we're at right in meters, so times 10 to the minus 15th meters cubed. This comes out to be 2.3 times 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. It's a crazy density. If you have any feeling for densities, this is unbelievably larger than any densities you deal with in normal materials. But we're talking about the nucleus, I mean, some of those dense stuff in the universe, atomic nuclei. One way to put how dense it is, is that if you had a cubic meter of nucleons, of these iron 56 uh, nuclei, that cubic meter would weigh the same as uh, about 61 cubic kilometers of water. Very dense. As I mentioned a few times, the mass of nucleons is different when they're separate versus when they're in a nuclei, or when they're put together. And this comes about due to the energy needed to push these nucleons together. So similar when you're talking about molecules, we think about this as the binding energy. Take two nucleons, say like a proton and a neutron. When they get pushed together, or end up getting bound together, there's a bunch of energy that needs to go into that binding, and that energy ends up coming from the mass of the nucleons. So you push them together, each of the nucleons loses a little bit of mass, and that mass converts into the energy that's binding them together. The opposite process of that would be if you have nucleons together, you need to put in some energy in order to release them. Right? It's the same energy, you call it binding energy. You can also think about it as like the dissociation energy we talked about with chemical bonds. but you basically put in a bunch of energy in order to pull them apart, and that energy ends up going into the mass of each of the nucleons. All that is to say that when you put nucleons together, the sum of the masses of the nucleons together is less than the sum of the masses when they're apart. The difference between these masses is known as the mass defect, or sometimes just called the mass difference, and you can get that just by looking at, well, this is in terms of the atomic mass number and the atomic number, but A minus Z is just N, number of neutrons. So you add the mass of all the protons and all the neutrons when they're separate, when they're by themselves, and then you subtract the mass of the nucleus when they're all together. The difference of those two things is the mass defect. And again, that difference is always going to be positive because you lose that mass that goes into binding energy, so you can find that binding energy by going back to Einstein's relation for energy mass equivalence, where that loss in mass, or that difference in mass, multiplied by c squared, is the binding energy of that nucleus. That's where the mass went. All right, how about another example? I want to calculate the mass defect and binding energy of a deuteron. It's a proton and a neutron together in a nucleus. We're told the mass in kilograms and in mega electron volts per c squared. Um, I think we've seen this unit before, but it's a way of 
measuring mass or quantifying mass in terms of electron volts, but you also need C squared in order to have the units of mass come out. It's a little bit odd when you first see it, but it can be very useful calculation-wise, and you'll, we'll see that. Okay, well, let's just do it. So our mass defect, again, it's just the sum of the proton masses and the neutron masses minus the nucleus, the mass of the nucleus when they're together. So in this case, they're just one proton, one uh, neutron, and then the mass is the mass of our deuteron, my word deuteron. I don't know if we've said this before, but this is the masses of the proton in terms of mega electron volts per c squared. This is the neutron's mass in mega electrons per c squared. And they told us the mass of the nucleus, those two together, is 561. Just interesting to note here that I said the proton and the neutron mass are very similar. The neutron is actually slightly heavier, just a little bit, but they're very similar. All right, so you just add all these things together. We end up with 2.24 mega electron volts per C squared. And you could put that into kilograms if you want, but it turns out that this unit of mass is quite useful in nuclear physics, so we kind of tend to use it a lot, partly because it's very easy to convert it to energy. So this is A, that's the mass defect. B, the binding energy, is that mass defect times C squared. Uh, 2.24 mega electron volts. So something interesting to note though is thinking about this energy versus the energy of say like binding an uh, electron to um, a nucleus. For instance, hydrogen, uh, its electron in the lowest or, uh, orbital state had an energy of 13.6 eV. Hydrogen so that was the energy that you would need to give the electron in order to uh, pull it off of the nucleus. 13.6 right? electron volts. Compare that to the energy that you need to give to the neutron and the proton, or whatever you want to think about it, the energy you need to put into a deuteron nucleus in order to pull them apart. Something like 100,000 times greater than the energy to take an electron off of a hydrogen. When you start thinking about sort of building up nuclei now, like adding more and more protons and neutrons to a uh, nucleus in order to get to bigger elements, larger nuclei, there's an interesting thing that happens is that the binding energy per nucleon changes as you try to add more and more neutrons and protons. I mean, that's sort of expected because once you put, say, like a proton and a neutron together, you want to bring another proton in. You gotta fight against the proton that's already there, and it takes more energy to get that proton in. In fact, per nucleon, it takes more energy to put another neutron in, too. And you keep putting more and more protons and neutrons in, it gets harder and harder to put them in. This has to do with the binding energy per nucleon. So it's just the total binding energy of a nucleus divided by the atomic mass number. And so if you start out with hydrogen, and you think putting more protons and more neutrons in, then it gets harder and harder to keep doing that. That's the rise, pretty steep rise, on the left-hand side. There's actually a dip on that lithium, it looks like. But overall, it continues to just rise up. It's harder and harder to put in. You've got to put more and more energy in to make the nucleus larger and larger until you get to iron, right around iron, mass number 56. Right around there, once you start putting in more nucleons, more neutrons, more protons, past iron, the energy you need to put in per nucleon actually starts to go down. Right? So it starts to become easier in a way to add more nucleons. And then if you think about the stability of these nuclei, right? like when we were thinking about molecules, if they had a larger binding energy, then it was harder to break that molecule apart. Right? You need to put in more and more energy to pull the atoms apart. In that case, there were atoms connected by electromagnetic forces.
Here, we have nucleons that are held together by a strong force, right? but it's the same sort of idea. If there's a larger binding energy per nucleon, that means you need to put in more energy to pull the nucleon out. That is to say that the peak here around iron is the most stable nucleus that there is. Left and right of that, both less binding energy per nucleon. And also on this chart is shown these arrows for fusion and fission, which are nuclear processes that we'll talk about more in a little bit. But basically, if you're below iron, then a nuclear process called fusion will tend to combine nucleons together and want to go towards more stable nuclei, and so they kind of tend towards making iron. Versus fission, where you're breaking nuclei apart, the stuff above iron, if it goes through fission processes, it breaks apart and ends up also going towards the more stable nuclei, which ends up being iron. 